ask with um, if the alkyne is on one, do we have to put the one? Yes, um, unless there's only one possible option for where it could be. So, you know, if you have propyne, it has to be between carbon one and two. It's either between carbon one and two on the left or between carbon one and two on the right, but it's this in the same spot either way. Um, if that if that's the case, then you don't need to say the name. And same for things like methyl, like you don't have you don't have to say two methyl propane because there is only one place for the methyl group to go. Um, I think that that's still the standard with alkynes. There might be some rule that says if it's on carbon one, you don't need to specify. But generally speaking, for all these functional groups um, where we have to say where they are, we're going to to indicate that with a one. Um, you don't. Oh, sorry. You don't need to specify it if it's in a ring structure. So like cyclohexene, you don't have to say one cyclohexene because wherever it is in the ring structure, that is carbon one and carbon two. And so Thank that you. I knew that there was an exception that that you were you were asking about, and it took me a second to remember it. Um, so yes, that that is the one exception if it's a ring structure. Um, and just as a quick aside. If we had, we're going to be dealing actually today with compounds called enols. And an enol is an alkene that also has an alcohol on it, as you may guess from the name. OL means alcohol. EN means, e means alkene. Um, if we have both of these, normally we would name both of these with a suffix add ol to the end of something to tell it say it's an alcohol and add the en change an to en to indicate that it's an alkene so in this case this is the one case where it is advent where you kind of have to break up the word in the middle so if it's one two three four five so it would be two pentene But then to name the OH, we would want to drop the sec the last E and add an OL. But we also need to specify where the alcohol is too. So it would be two pen ten five all. Because we're we have to kind of break it up in the middle because we have to say both where the where the alkene is and where the OH is. Um, and so that's when we get to these kind of molecules where you have multiple functional groups involved, that's where we will see some of those um, weird IUPAC names that we don't really have a better way, a way to get around naming them like that. But in general, and just to recap since for the recording, for alkynes, All we're going to do is drop the A-N-E, write Y-N-E. Um, alkynes and alkenes have another similarity, and that's that they both involve carbon-carbon pi bonds. Right? If, we have, if they both have carbon-carbon pi bonds, then Alkenes, their their orbitals look something like this, where you've got the sigma bond looks like you've got the sort of balloon shaped orbitals directly on top of each other. But then the pi bond, you have these unhybridized p orbitals that have to be sort of pointed the same direction, and you can get some amount of overlap between these two orbitals. And so that's why a pi bond is is one, it's less stable than a sigma bond and more prone to being broken up is because it doesn't have as much orbital overlap. So it's not as stable, um, but it does, it does form a bond that way. And alkynes just have two of those. So instead of having 
um, instead of having something where you've got a trigonal planar electron geometry and one pi bond, you have a linear electron geometry because you have two pi bonds that have to be 90 degrees from each other. What did we know about alkenes when it came to how reactive they were? Where did they react? At the pi bond? They're always at the pi bond, right? And the pi bond reacted in one way or another. We broke the pi bond and we added something to each side, right? Um, alkynes are going to be very similar. We just have two pi bonds. So some of our alkene reactions will actually be the same. Um, we are just going to do them twice. And then some of our alkene reactions will be the same, and, and we can allow them to only happen once, but then they, they're subtly different because they can either rearrange themselves a little bit. Um, we'll see that with hydration reactions. When we make one of those enols where the OH is directly attached to the alkene, it can rearrange itself. Um, but in general, most of the reactions are going to be the same as the reaction we wind, we would expect to see for, for the alkenes. So we're not really adding new mechanisms, really, other than some of those rearrangements. Um, and the way we make alkynes is very similar to the way that we make alkenes as well. So if we wanted to make an alkene, we need an, an alkyl halide, and we would do an elimination, right? Um, if we have a dibromide, we can do a double elimination, which are my, my son's favorite episodes of Top Chef are the double elimination episodes. When they announce it's going to be a double elimination, he gets super amped up and excited. It's a double elimination, mom. That's what alkynes are like. They're just a double elimination. You do the same elimination, but twice. Um, we found out that all of the old seasons of my, my wife and I have been watching Top Chef since we were in college. Um, it's still, it's the only reality TV show we can agree on. Um, and uh, and we found out that all the old seasons are on Hulu. And so we've been going back and rewatching all the old seasons with my son and he loves it. Um, so we need a strong base and the stronger the base, the more we can favor the products here. But beyond that, there's nothing new about this elimination. Um, although we can, one of the things that's really helpful about this is if we have a strong enough base, we can actually get this to migrate to the end of the carbon chain to make what's called a terminal alkyne. So a terminal alkyne just means it's an alkyne at the end of the carbon chain. It's not in the middle of the carbon chain. And so the base that we typically use is um, amide ion, sodium amide. Amide is NH2 with a negative charge. So now we've seen three different nitrogen-based molecules, right? Um, we have NH4 with a plus charge was ammonium. NH3 was ammonia. And amide is NH2 with a negative charge. So it's, so ammonium, is ammonia that's acted as a base, right? It's taken an H plus from something else. Amide is ammonia that is missing an H plus. And it's, it's really, really strong base. It's a much stronger base than alkoxide ions or um, hydroxide. And as a result, it means we can favor elimination really, really efficiently. Um, and so we see this sodium amide, and it typically has to be done in ammonia as the solvent to make sure that you don't get side products forming. You can't do this in water because then your amide just steals proton from the water instead of doing the, the double elimination. Um, so, and that, that presents its own challenges because ammonia has a boiling point that's like negative 40 Celsius. So you have to do this with um, uh, dry ice temperatures. And you have to, in order to, and you have to basically, you have to do what's called drying the ammonia gas. You have to get ammonia gas, either generate it from a solution, but then that means it's going to have water vapor in it as well. Um, and then you would need to dry the gas before you could use that, before you could condense it and use the ammonia. Um, 
or you have to have ammonia in a cylinder, a gas cylinder in order to do this. Um, so it presents its own challenges when you want to do something in ammonia as the solvent, at least on Earth. Um, I'm trying to think of which moon it is. One of the moons of Jupiter, I think it is, has um, has liquid ammonia. It, they have weather patterns, um, basic where ammonia is the dominant liquid is instead of water. Um, so on a different planet, this might be sort different um, if you had different ambient temperatures and and didn't have any water around naturally. Um, but for us, we have to pay attention to that. Um, but if you do that, if you use sodium amide in ammonia, um, you wind up doing the double elimination reaction, and then you actually wind up deprotonating the alkyne itself. And so you wind up making what's called an alkanide ion, or if it's just two carbons long, it's called acetylide. And sometimes you hear me use acetylide um, for anything where you have this al deprotonated alkyne. Um, and that winds up being a really helpful thing because now we have a carbon with a negative charge on it. And a carbon with a negative charge is helpful because that normally we're used to carbon having a positive charge, right? Or at least a partial positive charge. If you have a carbon with a negative charge on it, that can act as a nucleophile. And this gives us a way to attach extra carbons onto something else by going through a substitution reaction. Um, where you wind up using this alkanide ion as a nucleophile. Um, it then once we have this alkanide ion, it follows all of our standard rules for nucleophiles. If you expose it to something that has a good leaving group, it'll force that leaving group to go and you wind up with a substitution reaction. Um, but the difference is that now we've we have a way of with ozonolysis, we have a way of breaking up um our carbon structure and making our carbon structure smaller. And now with alkanide ions, this gives us a way to add carbons to a, another molecule to make a bigger pieces. Um, and then if you put this in the presence of water though, you wind up with the alkanide just winds up taking up deprotonating the water and you wind up making hydroxide and you wind up with your terminal alkyne. Right, so this would be another two-step reaction where we need the reactions to happen two different ways because you can't have the water present initially. So we, our first step would be sodium amide slash ammonia, NH3. Um, and then our second step would be expose it to water. So we might write it as one, Na, NH2, and then if you see a slash written um, in this in the shorthand, that usually means that um, if if you're not sure what it means, then you would want to look it up before you did this reaction in lab to see what they were trying to say. But usually it means whatever's after the slash is your solvent. We'd write it as NaNH2 slash NH3 to say that it's sodium amide reacting in ammonia. And then your, our second step would be water. So it gets, it gets a little tricky to keep this looking neat. Um, and you can always show the, sec, you know, the intermediate in between step one and step two if that's a way to, to make it look neater. Um, and so you can follow what's happening better. Um, but this would be the, the way we would write this overall reaction. And if you write, if you do excess ammonia, it actually can drive the equilibrium to, um, to the point where you wind up with your triple bond migrating, basically doing a rearrangement along the way to to make sure that you always wind up with that terminal alkyne. If you use just the right of sodium amide, you can wind up doing the double elimination reaction, um, but keeping it where that where the two bromines were. If it says excess 
amide, though, that always means it has to go all the way to the end of a carbon chain because you can't deprotonate it like this unless it's at the end of a carbon chain, right? Because you don't have a proton to deprotonate. You don't have a proton to give up if you have an alkyne in the middle of a carbon chain, right? Because all of your bonds are to other carbons then. So you can use that equilibrium pressure to force that alkyne group to the very end of the carbon chain, um, which can be very useful in terms of synthesis. So let's practice. It says excess, frequently, most frequently you will see excess written because it's hard to measure out the exact amount of sodium amide without having excess. Does it matter if our two bromines are on the same carbon or on adjacent carbons? No, it still will go through an elimination reaction, right? So for A, make sure you don't lose any carbons. So we had four carbons in a row in a dimethyl. So the temptation is to draw it like this so you can still keep track of where all four of your carbons are. But remember, it's really going to be linear. So it would look more like, so that would be the way we draw it if we were keeping everything at 120 degrees. Um, although it's more accurate to draw it as like that. And again, to indicate that that's, there's a break there when it's linear like that, it's not wrong to draw it as to write in the carbons to show that they're there. So I probably wouldn't mark you down, at least not at this stage, I wouldn't mark you down for drawing it this way, but it's better to make sure that you're drawing it as close to the right angles as possible. So the bottom two options are better options. And then you get anything, you get the exact same thing for B, right? Still four carbons in a row is our longest carbon chain with the dimethyl group. We just start with adjacent chlorines instead of chlorines on the same carbon. And they'll both still go through the elimination. So we would wind up with. the same molecule. And again, if you're drawing the carbons in, it's not necessarily a bad idea to write that hydrogen in at the end. You just have to remember it's not another carbon attached. Uh, if you're doing a skeletal structure, we wouldn't usually write that at that final hydrogen at the end. All right, so again, this was all just to show that, that our standard way of making alkynes is the same way as our way of making alkenes, which is to say we use elimination reactions. We just have to do it twice in the case of uh, if we were trying to make an alkyne. And we need to be aware that if it's in the middle of a ring structure and we have excess ammonia, or sorry, excess amide, it's gonna move to the end, whichever end is closer. And whichever end it can go with um, where it doesn't have to move any carbons along the way, right? Because you can't have it migrate. You can't migrate a methyl group if we're talking about an alkyne rearranging because you can only have two things attached to each of the those two carbons, right? Um, 
And so it'd be hard to predict exactly what we would get if you did this with something, if we had an alkene or a, if we had something that looked like, this this would find a way to rearrange itself to make make it so that you got the terminal alkyne but it'd be kind of difficult to predict what it would look like because it would need to move two methyl groups in order to do that right because you can't just move one methyl group to do the migration or even the elimination really right and so you if you tried to do to do this reaction with a complicated um, a complicated halide like this, you would get something. It would react if you put this with, with the sodium amide, but it'd be difficult to predict in advance exactly what it would make because there's a lot of possibilities. They're going to wind up, and they're all going to be pretty unfavorable processes um, to make them and not necessarily predictably so. So you probably wind up with a mess of different products in this case. So I'll, we will stick to asking you these questions where they're relatively simple molecules for doing this. And if we're trying to make a more complicated molecule, what we'll do is we'll start with a simple dibromide and deprotonate or and, um, do the double elimination and then use it as a nucleophile. That's a way we could put this together to make a complicated alkyne where we put the double with a triple bond exactly where we want it is to make take a simple um, dibromide and turn it into a nucleophile and then have it attack um, another molecule. So this is where synthesis starts getting a little bit more complicated than just picking one right reaction. You have to start sort of um, it's it's a little bit like picking the right Lego pieces to make one big Lego sculpture. You can you have to have some vision there sometimes, right? what exactly are these three pieces doing when I put them together? I don't know yet, but I'm going to use them later. Um, and so you guys being able to see that takes some practice. Um, and then this is just a figure showing why those alkynes wind up making good nucleophiles. So these bases up in the top section, those are all strong enough to deprotonate an alkyne, a terminal alkyne. Um, anything, the alkoxides and hydroxide, they're not strong enough bases to deprotonate that terminal alkyne. But the fact that we have such a strong base here means that it will also be a good nucleophile. And so if we have something else that this could attack, so this would be acetylide. Um, the one I didn't talk about, the common name, the alkyne that has a common name is two, we would name it as ethyne. So we would name this as ethyne. Um, the common name for this molecule is acetylene. So acetylene that you use for welding. Um, is just two carbons triple bonded to each other. And so when you deprotonate that, you get acetylide with a negative charge. So this is a really convenient way to add um, two carbons to something because now if you expose that to say, one bromopropane, it's going to come in here and attack. I know I'm drawing on top of the other writing, um, but I'm, we're just recapping how substitution works. If you have a, st a strong nucleophile and a good leaving group, you can just bring your nucleophile in and attack that carbon that has the good leaving group. And so this would turn one bromopropane and acetylene, we could turn that into two pentyne by linking these two things together, right? Just 
that's just one more nucleophile. The reason we covered substitution and elimination in such depth early on is we'll keep using substitution. I'm just going to teach you guys more nucleophiles. And here's the really common one is to to turn an alkene or to turn an alkyne into a nucleophile. All right, let's go ahead and take our break here. Let's come back at five after nine and we'll do some more practice and then we'll add a couple, um, a couple other reactions in there. <laughs> 
All right, guys. Let's let's uh, go ahead and come on back here. And here's a couple of examples of how we could use this um, these techniques as. Uh, I guess this first one doesn't work. I gotta adapt this first one. Um, uh, a couple of examples how we could how we would write using the uh, the alk alkanide ion as a nucleophile. Um, give me one second to adjust this. All right, so here we go. This is a better option. The top one wasn't going to work the way it was because we only had one hydrogen we could deprotonate. All right, so for this first one, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, if you recognize, okay, I've got a terminal alkyne, that means that we have a proton we could lose. The first thing that's going to happen is when you when you expose it to sodium amide, you deprotonate that terminal alkyne. So leave all the carbons where they are for now. And we're just turning that that alkyne into a negatively charged compound, which can then act as a nucleophile. So far, um, if our second step is then we're going to take this product, this alkanide, and expose it to ethyl iodide. Iodine is a really good leaving group. So we're just going to do a substitution reaction where our negative charge is going to come in here and boot the iodine off. Just do an SN2 reaction. So we're going to add two carbons to the end of our of our alkyne and it's really more like we're adding the alkyne to that ethyl group because we're just using this entire big long blue molecule as a nucleophile and it's bringing the rest of it with it so your final product here one two three four five carbons on the first Prius, and then we added two more carbons. And again, it can be helpful to draw everything where it go, where it is right now first, and then worry about if you need to rearrange things. So those are our two carbons that we added as an ethyl group. And again, if you try drawing this without writing those carbons out, you might, you know, it's. Come on, come sit behind Ash's chair. Easy to see why it's helpful to draw those carbons sometimes, because if you don't, it's easy to lose track of the number of carbons, right? This doesn't look right when I draw without writing those carbons out, because it seems like there are not enough carbons there in a row. But if you count them, We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The trick is to remember that if you don't have the carbons drawn in, that where the triple bond stops and starts is a carbon. This little juncture 
on each side is a carbon. If it's we're for drawing a true skeletal structure, though, we don't usually show that. Right. So that's what's what's shown up here. Um, and and this textbook shows it as a break to indicate that there's a, a junction there. Some textbooks don't even do that. They draw it all as one straight line and then they just add the triple bond over section of the line, which is really hard to follow what's going on. Um, but that's why I'm never gonna mark you down. Even if I ask for skeletal structure, I'm not gonna mark you down if you write those carbons in there as part of the alkyne, um, because otherwise it can get very, very confusing, especially if you're not the neatest when it comes to drawing your structures. Um, or if you're if you're pressed for space, if you don't have much space. So um, just be cognizant of that. They're both valid ways of doing it. You just need to make sure you don't lose a carbon when you do that. All right, and let me draw this back on so I can leave it up there for you guys to look at. If we start from acetylene, well, that's really a terminal alkyne in two directions, right? If we're careful with our stoichiometry, we can do the same thing twice. We're going to pull off one hydrogen from acetylene first, because acetylene is frequently written as C2H2, which is really... a two carbon alkyne. And that means it's got two terminal hydrogens, which means if we can do this same two steps to add an ethyl group to one side and then do the same two steps again to add a methyl group to the other side. We'll start by, and I'll try to keep these carbons color coded. If we keep call the the acetylene red, and we'll mark the ethyl group. We're going to add here blue, and we'll we'll go with green for the methyl group at the end. Green's not very easy to see. Do a different green for the end. All right. So after one step, we deprotonate one of the carbons and then use it as a nucleophile to replace the hydrogen here. So then we have our two red carbons and then we added our two blue carbons to one side and we still have the other hydrogen over here. So then if we do it again, but with a different alkyl halide, we can add something different to the other side. So the second step we're going to add, we're still we're gonna deprotonate the other carbon. And so we wind up with, One side stays the same. The other side, we added a single carbon to. Hey, Ben, you're not watching Ben. All right, so this gives us the ability to, to actually start from one or two carbon pieces and make something that's about as complicated as you want you would want. Um, and this is this is one way that from scratch, from what's known as syngas, which stands for for syn synthesis gas, um, which is basically just one or two carbon pieces all mixed together with some hydrogen, you can you can take that and refine it and turn it into whatever you want. So this is why petroleum and natural gas is so useful for chemists is because you can take a, it's the equivalent of 
of getting one of those big so you guys may not be current on on um, how they sell Legos these days, but you can get a big yellow bin of Legos. That's just a ton of random pieces that you can use to build whatever you want. That's what petroleum is for chemists. You don't you're going to get a random mixture of, of pieces in there. There's going to be some big pieces and some small pieces. But if you can separate them all out, you can arrange them however you want to make whatever you want at the end. So that's why petroleum is, is in everything. Petroleum is, is in pharmaceuticals. It's used to make um, road tar. It's used to make um, plastics. It's used to make everything basically because it's just a random assortment of pieces. Um, and for a long time, it was really, really, really cheap. Um, you know, when you think about when we as a society started burning fossil fuels back in the mid 1800s, um, for most of, of the history of petroleum being mined and, and used, it was really, really cheap. Um, I mean, even back, just you only have to go back to the 80s to find, to get gas prices under a dollar. Like that was expensive, was close to a dollar um, until they had the gas crisis during the Iran Contra affair in the 80s. Um, there really, really wasn't, yeah, gas was, it was cheaper to just buy gas and burn it than it was to like find a ways around anything, any of these issues, which is why we're sort of behind the eight ball when it comes to climate change and why petroleum is involved in everything in our society now, because it was cheap and easy, um, which really, really makes, makes me a little bit upset when you think about how long ago um, some of these petroleum refining companies uh, knew that climate change was a problem all the way back to the 80s again. Um, it was, you know, there have been internal documents released by Shell, not that were leaked from Shell and BP um, it, from the 80s that said that they knew climate change was an issue, but it was going to cost them more um, in uh, revenue to switch to something that wasn't gas. So they just kept making gasoline and refining petroleum anyway, even though they knew it was a societal issue. Um, and then from there, that's normally when I would launch onto into my tirade against capitalism and, as a whole, and you know, go go all Zach De La Roca on you. But um, I'll try to refrain from that um, today. Come to office hours if you want to hear my my sermon on anti-capitalism. Um, or when I'm not your teacher anymore, buy me a beer at Sedellus and, and we can talk it over with the uh, with the Sedellus crew. Let's, um, I'm sure I've mentioned this to most of you guys, but if you didn't know, Sedellus is the, is one of the brewer, is the, one of the brewers, breweries in South Lake Tahoe. And Chris Sedellus is, uh, <laughs> um, Chris Sedell, Seidel is um, a former um, LTCC student um, who uh, transferred to Davis and got his degree in in uh, winemaking and brewing and then came back to Tahoe to start a brewery. So he's um, he's a, uh, a hometown hometown boy, even though he is from Australia originally. We still consider him to be a hometown boy. So when you're in South Lake Tahoe looking for a beer, when all this craziness is over, you could do a lot worse than Sedellis. All right, let's move on to stuff more relevant. Um, two, so I mentioned earlier on that we were gonna have two alkene reactions. The, some, some alkene reactions can happen twice because really we just have two pi bonds if we have an alkyne, right? Um, and the ones that happen most predictably where it really is just like you do it twice are hydrogenation, hydrohalogenation, and halogenation. Um, so hydrohalogenation is when we added, you know, HBr. When then we added, we wound up protonating one side of the pi bond, which makes a carbocation on the other, other side, and then you add your bromide or your chloride as a nucleophile. Um, if, we, if we're going to do that twice, we're just going to wind up adding two halides to the same carbon. 
Um, hydrogenation was adding hydrogen to both sides. And halogenation was adding a bromine, bromine to both sides. So we can actually take or, or a chlorine to both sides. Um, and let's go through some of the specifics. If you hydrogenate with a catalyst like we've seen before, so if you take acetylene and you add um, two equivalents of hydrogen gas to it over a platinum catalyst, you get ethane. Um, and so that's just, it goes in two predictable steps. You break the pi bond on one, one of them, add a hydrogen to each side, and then you would get an intermediate that looked like ethene. And then if you have two moles of hydrogen gas for every one mole of your compound, you just would then do it again. You now have an alkene, and now we know that when you put alkenes together with hydrogen and with catalyst, you get hydrogenation happening. Um, so that's pretty, that's pretty standard. That makes a lot of sense. The problem is if we only want one, if we only want to add one hydrogen to it, if we want to partially hydrogenate, and this is where the term partially hydrogenated soybean oil comes from. Soybean oil is naturally um, polyunsaturated fatty acid, and you can take, and that means that it's got carbon-carbon pi bonds in the chain in more than one spot. If you fully hydrogenate it, you turn it into a saturated fat. So that's how you can use things like you can treat soybean oil and turn it into Crisco. Fully hydrogenated soybean oil is Crisco. Is shortening basically it's vegetable shortening. Um, if you partially hydrogenate it, though, you can get it to to be less healthy for you, um, but also better for frying things than than having something that's polyunsaturated. Um, the, but the problem is we can't partially hydrogenate an alkyne because what you get instead is if you only add one equivalent of hydrogen. Um, the alkene that you make is actually more reactive than the alkyne was. So what you wind up doing is you wind up fully hydrogenating half of it instead of partially hydrogenating all of it. So we, we're we not gonna use platinum as our catalyst if we're trying to partially hydrogenate an alkyne. Um, because we don't, we would get a mixture of products. We'd get half of it left over as acetylene and half of it turned all the way into ethane. If we wanted to partially hydrogenate, we have to use a different catalyst. Um, and they, they actually call this a very, very colorful name. Um, they call it a poisoned catalyst. This is a regular catalyst that they just treat to make it not as good at catalyzing things. Um, and so they refer to it as a poisoned catalyst. And what that does is it will take a, an alkyne and only allow it to react halfway. So it'll react once and it's a syn addition, which means you'll make the cis product and then it stops. Um, and so the, the most common one that we see used is called Lindler's catalyst. And Lindler's catalyst um, is is um, palladium, which is a really good catalyst on its own, but then they take the palladium and then they treat it with um, calcium carbonate and a little bit of lead oxide. And that basically the lead and the calcium carbonate react together on the surface to basically eliminate some of the reactive sites on the surface. Um, and what that does is it, it means that it won't fully hydrogenate. Um, and so frequently you will just see it either see it written as poisoned catalyst or more commonly you'll just see it written as Lindler's catalyst. And if it doesn't give you a number for how many equivalents of hydrogen gas you're using, um, you can you can assume it reacts to completion. You have as much hydrogen as you need, basically. Um, but if you have as much hydrogen you need as you need in Lindler's catalyst, it'll stop as the cis product. So we would wind up making this product if you use the Lindler's catalyst. 
versus if you use hydrogen gas on platinum, you'll fully hydrogenate it. So you would wind up with I think that's the right number of carbons. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. I just flipped it over so the methyl's on the other side because of the, the spacing. Right. So again, same reaction we've seen before. We're just adding some wrinkles to it when it comes to, okay, just like with, with hydration, we have three different versions of hydration for alkenes, right? We had Markovnikov with rearrangement, Markovnikov, no rearrangement, and anti-Markovnikov. This is just now ways that we can control different versions of hydrogenation. We have full hydrogenation and partial hydrogenation. Um, and then if we want, what's the other possible way that we would, could possibly want to um, rearrange the partial hydrogenation? This was a makes a cis alkene. We could conceivably want a trans alkene, right? Um, those are less common. We don't see those nearly as much in nutrition because trans trans alkenes in nutrition are really bad for you. That's what a trans fat is. Um, they taste really good, but they don't occur in nature. Um, which means that if you eat them, your body doesn't have a way to break them down. And so es essentially, as they, if they get incorporated into your, your triglycerides in your fatty acids, um, in your fat cells, your body basically can't do anything about that. And they're basically there forever. Um, they don't really mess with you too much beyond that, um, which is why they passed through the FDA at first because they didn't seem to have any side effects, but it wasn't until they realized that, oh, hey, your body is, bas you basically put something into your body that's a, the equivalent of putting plastic into the environment. Um, there exists no natural process to break trans fats down. Therefore, your body, they just stay in your body indefinitely. Um, so we don't see them as much nutrition. They are help really useful in terms of um, pharmaceuticals and plastics, um, because in they're still useful in pharmaceuticals because you're not usually incorporating them into a fatty acid chain. They can be useful in terms of making specific molecules that your body can process, just not as a nutritional ingredient. Um, and so our other way of partially hydrogenating is what's called a dissolving metal reduction, which is um, just as nasty as, as it sounds. You have to use ammonia as your solvent and you, you need to use metallic sodium, um, which for those of you guys who had Gen Chem in a lab is the, com the uh, classic um, demonstration of put, put sodium metal in water and watch it catch on fire and then explode. You guys remember that one? Um, so it's not something that we typically want to work with if there's another way around it, but it happens to react with an alkyne in a way that that preferentially makes the trans alkene. So it does a partial hydrogenation and makes the trans product. Um, and we won't go over the mechanism for it because it's not super well understood and it's very complicated. Um, but basically you wind up making sodium ions and and um, Ammonium no, and amide. So you wind up making sodium amide, which itself is super reactive um, as your byproduct. But you do get, and it's a pretty good yield um, of the trans product. And I'm not going to test you on the yield per se, but just to know that like even this is a lot of times when we want to make something a specific isomer we're still making the other isomer along with it. Um, it's a little bit, the um, using poison catalyst is a little bit of a um, unique situation and then it, it will basically 100% make the cis isomer. If we wanna make the trans isomer, the best we can do is 80%. Um, and again, it's just re referred to as the dissolving metal reduction. Uh, I think you could probably use other 
um, other alkali earth metals. Is that the alkali metals? I don't remember what the what that one's called. Uh, group one, other group one metals. Um, but sodium is most commonly used because just like we don't usually use uh, iodine and fluorine in, in halogenation reactions, um, sodium is sort of in that sweet spot. Potassium's too reactive and lithium's not re reactive enough. You could do lithium, but it would go really, really slowly. And so the other interesting thing that we can do um, when it comes to, now that we have all these different types of reactive groups is we can start stringing them together to make series of reactions. Um, so for instance, if we started by doing a double elimination to make the terminal alkyne, then exposed it to ethyl chloride, so our terminal alkyne could act as a nucleophile, and then exposed it to a poisoned catalyst and hydrogen, we're gonna get an intermediate after each of these steps. And it's helpful sometimes to show the entire process. So after step one, we would get So again, with that excess sodium amide, that means we're going to end with the depro deprotonated alkyne, which then will act as a nucleophile in step two, and we're going to be and it's ethyl chloride. So we're going to replace the chlorine with this whole big nucleophile. So we're, the net result is we're adding two carbons to our alkyne. And then step three, we've got hydrogen with Lindler's catalyst, which is our poison catalyst. And almost always, if you have a, a catalyst that's a solid, um, which most commonly, again, is stuff something like platinum, or in this case, it's the poison catalyst. But if you have a solid, if you have a surface, it's almost always going to be a, a syn addition because you are reacting on the surface of something, which means only the piece of the molecule that's attached to the surface is actually doing the reacting. So it's pretty much always going to give you a syn addition, which gives us a cis product. Hi, Kat. So we'd wind up with a final product after all three steps that looks like this. Right. And again, the key is recognizing the reactive part of the molecule in each of these. We didn't change the ring structure at any point. We turned that dihalide into a nucleophile in step one, used it to go through a substitution reaction in step two, and then we basically got rid of the alkyne. We turned it into the cis alkene, but we could have fully hydrogenated it. And then we would just have, we would have what butyl cyclohexane with no out with no pi bond involved at all anymore. And so, and then from here, if we wanted to say, turn this into an alcohol, we could then, um, we could then do one of our hydration reactions. Now that we ended at an alkene, we could keep going with the alkene and go any any direction we wanted, really, um, because we have lots of reactions that involve alkenes, right? Um, the other two reactions that were on our, our list here of um, hydrohalogenation, they react pretty much the way you would expect. If you, we basically just look at the stoichiometry. If we had something like 
propyne plus one equivalent of HBr. Well, if it was an alkene, HBr would mean, okay, we break a pi bond, put a hydrogen on the less substituted side and the bromine on the more substituted side, right? So if it's an alkyne, after one step, we're just gonna get this molecule. After two steps, if we then took this and did plus HBr again, we're gonna break the remaining pi bond and do it again. So we'd wind up making dibromo, 2,2-dibromo propane. Right, you guys see how it's, the reaction is pretty much identical. We make something that looks a little bit weird, having a halogen attached to an alkene. We haven't seen that that often, but it doesn't break any of our rules. Um, and so we can do that then twice. And same with halogenation. If we did plus Br2, if we started with the same molecule, If we did a halogenation, that adds a, breaks, a, breaks a pi bond and puts a bromine on each side, right? And it was the anti-addition. And so after one step, it would look like and being an anti-addition, we do want to pay attention to, we're going to make the trans product. But then if there's another equivalent of bromine around, it just does it one more time. So we would wind up with 1122 tetrabromo propane. Right, so, and there's not really any significant tweaks to the reaction mechanism like there is with hydrogenation. Um, we can do these halfway. Hydrogenation, we couldn't because we made the alkene that was too reactive. These ones, we can allow it to happen halfway if we have one equivalent of the compound. And so, um, won't spend too much more time on these right now. There's lots of practice to be done with those on Thursday. Um, the other two big ca categories of reactions that we talked about on, on uh, when it came to alkenes were hydration reactions. We had three different variations of hydra hydration reactions, right? We had acid catalyzed, which was Markovnikov with rearrangement. We had oxymercuration, which was Markovnikov, no rearrangement. And then we had hydroboration, which was anti-Markovnikov, no rearrangement. Um, we'll talk about those. That's what we'll spend our time talking about on Thursday. Um, the other category was ozonolysis. And remember, ozonolysis was basically expose it to O3 and then dimethyl sulfide. And you're basically going to cleave that molecule into pieces. You can chop it up and replace the alkene with a, with a ketone, with a carbonyl. Um, and this one actually is a lot simpler. Go back and do those. Um, the big difference with ozonolysis is instead of ending with a carbonyl, we're replacing three bonds instead of just two and replacing all of them with an oxygen bond. So for, for alkenes, when we break, when we go through ozonolysis, we break two bonds, replace both of them with an oxygen, we get a carbonyl. For an alkyne, 
you're breaking three bonds and cutting it in half. But that means we have to replace three bonds all with oxygen bonds. So instead of making a carbonyl, we get a carboxylic acid. So if we had our, our propyne molecule and it went through ozonolysis, we would wind up with two carboxylic acids. And so we're cutting it right there. We're cutting one carbon off from one side, cutting, and then the other piece has two carbons. So the one carbon side would turn into formic acid or methanoic acid. The other side that has two carbons would turn into ethanoic acid or acetic acid. So again, not significantly different in how the actual mechanism happens or how we, we would go about getting our final product, you just have to add one more oxygen bond. And because an alkyne can only have one other thing attached to it, that means that when we do this, this ozonolysis with an alkyne, the products are always going to wind up with your oxygens attached to the end of a carbon chain. Because if you have something that's a straight line and you cut it in half, where you cut it in half by definition now has is the end of each of the two pieces that was left before. Whereas when it was an alkene, you could have multiple things still attached to it. And so you could wind up with, well, maybe it's an aldehyde or maybe it's a ketone. Maybe it's at the end of a carbon chain. Maybe it's in the middle of a carbon chain. You can't have that with an alkyne because, all, because three of the four carbon bonds were part of that alkyne and are now part of the carboxylic acid. Um, so there's one more thing I want to show you guys. You've seen it once before, before Thursday. Um, acid catalyzed hydration, again, looks a lot like our regular alkene acid catalyzed hydration, except that alkynes are less um, reactive. And so we actually have to use mercury as a as a catalyst. It's not quite the same as oxymercuration, although you do make an intermediate that looks sort of like our intermediate from oxymercuration. Um, but it does allow for rearrangement in a way that oxymercuration did not. Um, and although the most significant thing about it is that you wound up making what's called an enol. I mentioned this earlier, and enols, when you have your alkene and your alcohol separate from each other, are relatively stable, stable enough that we have our own rule for naming them. Um, but when you have your OH directly attached to an alkene, it winds up actually rearranging itself to become more stable. And so that's the part that I wanted you guys to see. is that you can wind up with those enols rearranging themselves to make a carbonyl. If you start with an enol, if you have acid or base around, either way, it can be this, what's, this is what's called a tautomerization. If you're rearranging your bonds, but you're not really changing the position of any nuclei, it's you're changing the position of a hydrogen, um, but you're not really breaking any sigma bonds to do this. Um, it's it's making what's known as a tautomer. And so this is the tautomerization. When it's acid catalyzed, you start by basically, it's a lot like acid catalyzed hydration. You start by breaking the pi bond and that makes a carbocation, but then you wind up with this resonance happening um, where the 
keto or where the oxygen can donate a pair of electrons to turn into a carbonyl, and then you can deprotonate that oxygen. And so you can convert between an enol and a ketone or an enol and an aldehyde um, pretty readily. Um, and this is this is one of the things that can actually happen to sugars in your body. Simple sugars, um, when they're in their open chain form, um, actually are they usually have a carbonyl in them. They always have a carbonyl in them, and that carbonyl can wind up being converted between an enol and that carbonyl. Um, and so that's it can change what the stereochemistry is of the sugar, which is one of the ways that you can switch back and forth between different stereoisomers of, glu of glucose um, is by with these rearrangement reactions, these tautomerizations. Um, and this happens all the time with acetone as well. If you have acetone, pure acetone, and it's exposed to either an acid or a base, it will spontaneously rearrange. It's always in an equilibrium between enol and and acetone. Um, it just happens that equilibrium favors making a carbonyl group much more than it favors staying as the enol. So when, when we do these hydration reactions um, of, of uh, alkynes, the first step is basically the same as you expect. You break a pi bond, you add an OH to one side. And whether which side you add it to depends on if it, is it the Markovnikov or the anti-Markovnikov. But then it they will always rearrange to make the carbonyl group. So you don't wind up with an OH added, you wind up with a carbonyl added. But the net result is still we added an H2O. So it's still considered hydration. It just doesn't look like an an alcohol at the end. Um, and we see the same thing. So like I said, depending on whether we use um, hydroboration or the acid catalyzed, mercury catalyzed version, we'll make the Markovnikov versus the anti-Markovnikov. Um, but either way, we wind up making the carbonyl at the end not making, not leaving it as that enol formation. All right, and we'll, re, we'll cover that again in more detail when we start on Thursday. Um, and we actually went through almost all of, of chapter nine today. So I know we went fast, we'll get, that's why we'll take our time and do lots of practice. The second half, once I have to leave, um, y'all have a, an assignment for you, but we'll, I'll work you, We'll work our way together through some of these as well. And then I'll leave the room open when I leave so that you guys can um, continue to work in small groups or, or however you want to do it um, for that um, um, assignment for next, for Thursday. All right. So everybody show up to lab today. Um, I think I'm going to, I have a set of lab glassware here. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the lab glassware in front of my webcam. We'll go through the various parts of the, of the mechanism of the um, apparatus rather, and talk about what the procedure steps would be. So we get some actual, you won't get hands-on experience, but we'll actually be talking about the practical aspect of, of making some of these compounds. All right. So show up. Um, I'll record it as well, but it's always good to be, be there in real time. So. I will see you then. Thanks, Sean.